So this is our uh, second lecture on in Chapter 2 on force vectors. It's just a big review, a review of a lot of math that you're already pretty comfortable with, or some of you may have to do a more in-depth analysis or an in-depth review of the material to come up to speed. Okay, we talked about vector operations. Uh, we've talked about multiplying by a scalar to stretch it, compress it, flip it, make it go the opposite direction, uh, how to add and subtract uh, vectors graphically. And we use the parallelogram law of addition. So you put um, if a, the base of one vector A and the base of another vector B together, the base, but if you move the base of B and put it at the head of A, and then you move the base of A and put it at the head of B, you form a parallelogram. And the diagonal to the parallelogram is the resultant of A plus B. And then you can use a triangle, half of the parallelogram, and it, the sine law and the cosine law to determine unknowns like the lengths of sides or magnitudes of the sides, as well as the angle, some of those angles. Then we're going to talk about uh, decomposing you can also decompose into components in uh, particular directions and then also describe the resultant force in relation to a horizontal axis. Sometimes they do it clockwise, sometimes they do it counterclockwise. Theta, what is the angle you know, of the resultant force measured counterclockwise from the horizontal angle. All right, on what page of the textbook is this parallelogram law of addition described? I know this is a trivial question, but I really want you to become familiar with your textbook. What page is it described? You know what, that's a little unfair because people don't have their book, do they? But you have your clickers, don't you? You have your clickers. You know, it's on page 18. It's an early part of chapter two. Where is the sign law described? Do you have a mental image of where that is? Did you look at it, review it in the textbook? It's where you have a triangle and they have interior angle A, B, C, law, lowercase, and then the magnitude of the side opposite, the magnitude of the side opposite, the magnitude of the side opposite. Both of those, a sine law and cosine law, are referred to in relation to this generic triangle. Well, they're on page 22, okay? So let's just keep going in the interest of time. Here's a problem. I'm not going to work it out. I'm just going to say you should be able to work out a problem like this. I encourage you to put this on the to-do list in addition to the homework problems, in addition to reading the chapter, in addition to following the, the example problem in the chapter. I encourage you to do this which would be to take this original force system consisting of F1 and F2, and given the angle phi, and come out analytically, not numerically, analytically with the resultant force system characterized by the magnitude of F of R and the orientation in 2D where theta is measured in the counterclockwise from the horizontal X axis. Well, that's a challenging task and it'll make you use the law of sines, the law of cosines. In addition, one of the ways that you might use, you may need to calculate the sine of theta plus or minus an angle phi. You ever seen a relationship like this? Yes, everybody. It's so far back in your mathematical prereqs, you may have forgotten it. What class was this in? Trigonometry? or maybe they called it something like pre-calculus math. Anyway, you could find that in the Appendix A of our textbook. Go and take a look at Appendix A of our textbook as you're reading through Chapter 2. Make sure that you're familiar with some of these. It's going to be rare that this will be needed on an exam. Very rare. Extremely rare. But you need to know the basic fundamental math, right? Just because I don't test you on it during an exam doesn't mean that it's not important. Okay, so take a look at Appendix A. Now we move into 
where we have a coplanar. What does this word coplanar mean? What does that mean to you? 2D, just X and Y. So we'll have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And we'll talk about unit vectors in the, which are designated by I and J. Have you seen the I and J? Sure. And I is a unit vector, meaning that it has magnitude of 1, length of 1, or magnitude of 1, and aligned with the X axis. What is J? J is a unit vector, has a length of 1, aligned with the Y axis. And when we get to 3D, guess what we're going to get? K is the third aligned with the Z. So we can describe a, f a force or a vector as the sum of something I plus something J in 2D in coplanar systems. So it's the magnitude in the X and the magnitude in the Y. A sub X, A sub Y. We're going to now talk a little bit about right triangles and similar triangles and Cartesian vectors and 2.6 is where you really wanted to get to. You didn't really want to get to the parallelogram law. You didn't really want to get to uh, so law of sines, you know, the cosine law. You didn't want to get to a lot of trigonometry. And basically, the world is good when we express vectors even in 3D in Cartesian format. And then it simplifies the math tremendously. All right, I want you to take a sheet of paper. I want you to divide it into six sections. So if this is your sheet of paper, you go like that. And each one of those six sections, I want you to draw a right triangle that is different than the one in the other six sections. I want you to sketch six right triangles on one sheet of paper. Got it? Make them different. Flip them. Stretch them. Compress them. But every one of these should be a right triangle. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, some people had a triangle. It was tucked like this. And some people, I don't know, the easiest one, everybody sort of started here. Or maybe they started here. Right? But you can really change it up. Uh, you could have a right triangle that does something like that. All right, I'm, it's kind of mimeographed in each of these, but uh, a lot of people did something and they did this on their right triangle. What did I just try and sketch? Is it big enough? Sorry if it's not, I can redo it. A little what, box. Where? A little box. A little box in one of the corners of our right triangle. What does that little box in the corner of the right triangle indicate? There is one of the interior angles of all right triangles that must be exactly 90 degrees. Sometimes we forget the obvious, don't we? All right, so that's one of the clues. It looks like everybody's got them. What we're going to find in this chapter and throughout the rest of statics, when we have 2D problems, we have to be experts at right triangles in this class as engineers. Do all of them have one interior angle equal to 90 degrees? Clicker question. Do all uh, right triangles, did I leave that word out? Do all right triangles have one interior angle equal to pi over 2 or 90 degrees? I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to be tricky there. I left out the word right, didn't I? All right triangles must have one angle that is a 90 degree angle. Otherwise, it's not a right triangle. It's a definition of what's a right triangle. Can any interior angle of a right triangle be greater than 90 degrees? We know one has to be precisely equal, but can any of them be greater than yes or no? This is all of a right triangle. I'm talking about a right triangle. Not an isosceles, not an equilateral.
All right. So the distribution of the answers are that the majority say no, they can't be. So uh, what what's the idea there? Who who's pretty confident that the answer is no? Why? How how can you explain it, please? Because all interior angles of only the right triangle or any, any triangle, right triangles included, all triangles, but all the sum of all the interior angles have to be equal to 180. True? Do you remember that rule? So if you have 180, and that's equal to the sum of interior A plus B plus C, and let's say that we let, okay, let C be 90, all right. Uh, could B or A be greater than 90? Impossible. The sum of A plus B must be precisely 90. They must be precisely 90. You're going to be experts at right triangles. That's what you're going to be. All right, let's continue on. All right, so we picked out our right triangle. Maybe we draw a crazy one. You meant like this. I don't like to draw it horizontal. Let's draw it like this like this and like this with a little box. Which angle is the 90 degree? The one with the little box right here, true? And they have a side over here. What is the name of the side opposite the 90 degree interior angle? And I don't want you to do alphanumeric input, so I give you A, B, C choices. It's either the hypotenuse or the hypotenuse or the hypotenuse, or the hypotenuse. Good luck talking your teams. <laughs> so let's see where we're at for the grade. Hey, we're pretty good. Not bad, huh? Not bad. Somebody says, These, are you testing my English? I guess so. But uh, let's press forward. Uh, there is another angle that we're going to call, and we're going to use a symbol like this for that angle. This, thing, this symbol is either a Roman letter, a Greek letter, a German letter, an Italian letter, or an English letter. It's Greek, is it not? is a Greek letter, and the name of this Greek letter is either alpha, beta, gamma, phi, or theta. It is theta, see? So not bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that right triangle. Maybe last time I sketched it like this and I put the 90. Well, let's change it up. I don't know. Let's put it like this and put the 90 there. And we just called this the hypotenuse. And we're going to pick one of the other two angles to be theta. And it really doesn't matter. On your piece of paper, get your piece of paper back. And why don't you mix it up? Kind of throw theta in this corner and theta in that corner. And on this triangle, put theta here. But only one theta. See what I'm doing? So theta could be here. Theta could be there. It really mix it all up. All right, now that you have that done, guess what? This other symbol is a letter, and guess what uh, it is? Hold it, that's too easy. Let's not waste our time. What do you think? And then what do you think its name is? Phi. Phi. So we're going to have a right triangle, maybe like uh, this. We're going to have a 90. We'll put theta there and phi there. True? What is this one opposite the 90? Hypotenuse. And then what we're going to do is we typically focus on theta. And for the angle theta, we can identify the edge of the right triangle, which is opposite our interior angle called theta. This would be the opposite side. What's this one? Hypotenuse. This one's opposite. What's this one called? 
adjacent. We're going to become masters of right triangles. So for each of these, you've picked one interior angle and you called it theta. The other you call phi. And what is the relationship between theta and phi? Is theta always greater than phi? Theta less than phi? Theta plus phi is 90. Theta plus phi is 180. Theta plus phi is 360. Right triangles, right triangles, right triangles. Maybe I should keep on emphasizing that right triangle. I try not to be tricky. All right, so let's take a look. There you go. This class may be one of the best classes I have. You can answer questions coherently. All right, so we know that the, the sum of all interior angles must be 180 of all triangles. It's true of the right triangle. One of the angles, the right triangle is 90, hence the other is the sum must be. Picking theta, identify the opposite side of the angle theta, we just said that was opposite, as well as the side that's adjacent. All right, we then talk about the lengths or magnitudes of those sides, the opposite and adjacent. True? What is the ratio of the opposite divided by the hypotenuse equal to? Uh, I think it's sine or the cosine or tangent or cotangent or secant. All right. So what did I just do? Oh, that was silly. Uh, this needs to stop. All right. Then what we do is we go here, and then we go back one. And there you go. It was the sign. All right? So just two people need to review a little bit so far. Right? Isn't it? All right, so it's the sign. On what page or where in the book could you find this? And I, I taught uh, statics for the first time. And then when I had the first exam come in, I noticed there was a pattern. At the top of the first exam, more than one person wrote this little thing up at the top of the exam. And I couldn't figure it out. I never heard of this before. What is this called? Sokoto, how many people have heard of it? I don't know where I was. I never heard of it, period. I'm honest. I never, ever heard of it. And so what is the SOH for? I'll take a, a volunteer in this row. What's the SOH for? Sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. All right. How about a volunteer over here, which is CAH? The adjacent over the hypotenuse, and then uh, tangent is opposite over adjacent. And that can help you remember and not mess those up. But after a while, you just know what they are. Boom, boom, boom. You do them. Okay? So where do you think you can find this in our textbook? Oh, it's not in our textbook. Yes, it is. Where do you think? Appendix A. Way back in a page like 600 and around 20, 618, 617, 620. So it's good to learn what's in your book, and so you can review it. All right, you have a vector. This is the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate. There's a force vector. It's put the beginning of the force vector traditionally at the origin of the coordinate system. They say its magnitude is 70 newtons, and they give you this angle to describe its orientation. It's 18 degrees as shown. All right? Can you express that force vector in Cartesian vector form? Meaning I would want F is equal to something I plus something J. True? And... 
for a clicker, what I'll do is I'll say, what is fx in units of Newton? So don't work try and type in Newton. I want the numeric value inputted with your clicker for f of x in this representation of the vector, 70 Newtons. I'm going to go ahead and get started, and we'll give you enough time. A minute and a half, enough time? You'll need your calculator. All right, let's take a look. Negative 21.6. All right, how did they figure it out? Did they say, look, it, I need a right triangle. I'm going to put the corner right there. Is that the right right triangle? Is that the correct right triangle to put in to solve this problem? No. What it is, is you want to decompose it into something that's perf, perf only along the X and only along the Y. And when I look at it, I can tell that it's going to have to go in the negative X. As well as, what about in the Y? Negative Y. So both of these up here, it will be a negative. This will be negative and this will be a negative. F of Y it will be negative as well. True? And then how did we get the 21.6? This is the hypotenuse of 70. And we're looking for the opposite oh. sign. Pardon? Oh. Yeah. So this so 70 times the sign of 18. Does that work? All right. Uh, let's just grade it and move on. What is f of y in units of Newton and the negative sign if it's needed is need you need to put it in. I'm sorry. Let's see how we did. All right. So Oh, look at that. Negative 60. Let's press on. Uh, I have another force. It's a uh, magnitude is 110 newtons. I want to express this in Cartesian vector form, which means I have this F. Maybe this is the second force. I put F2. And then I'm going to have F of X2 and in the I plus F of Y2 in the J. So I'm really interested in what is that component in the X and the component in the Y. Did they give me an angle? No. What did they do? What did they show right here? They've given you a right triangle. True. And it's a three, four, five right triangle. Very, very common. So this really brings up a topic that we need to go back and review. It is the topic of similar triangles. You can have similar isosceles triangles. You can have similar equilateral triangles. You can have similar right triangles. In this class, this semester, you're going to do a lot of similar right triangles. All right. So on a, get on a sheet of paper, maybe a new one, or have enough room on this other sheet of paper, I want you to sketch two right triangles that are similar that are similar. Show me. You're, you, you, you probably heard of similar triangles before. Show me two similar triangles. Half of this is just trying to keep you awake. All right. So what is true about similar triangles? I've got to switch it to multiple choice and then start it. What is true? They have the same length of the hypotenuse. Is that the key idea of a similar triangle? Or they have the same shape with the size related by a scaling factor. So what's the key idea? They have the same shape that's related by a scaling factor. What is the relationship between the interior angles of similar, let's call it right triangles, the larger triangle has larger interior angles. The smaller triangle has smaller interior angles. They have the same interior angles.
All right. I don't know. Somebody hit the wrong button for some odd reason. They all have the same interior angle. That's what they have. So if we want, we go back to this problem right here. They're basically telling you that this angle right here, this theta, is the same as that theta, isn't it? Yeah. And once you start to get used to this, doing it, you just bypass the theta. And let's go ahead and answer this question. What is f of x in units of Newton for this second vector right here? Basically, you're going to be three-fifths of 110 Newton, and uh, that's going to be fx. Forget the Newton, right? This magnitude, I didn't need that typed in. Is that how you use the similar triangles? Does it boil down to that? So what does that give us as an answer? 66. Look good? Thank you very much. But what about f of y? You already got it figured out. Pretty good. All right. That would be the four-fifths of the 110 for f of y. On a sheet of paper, sketch. Hey, I already did this. All right. Now we worked with this force, did we not? Hey, we already did that one. Hey, we, are, we just did this one, didn't we? If we add in this force, which is f of 2, which is 50 newtons, can you calculate the resultant force in Cartesian vector form? And to do that, you basically have to get the resultant into x. So that's your first clicker. Let's get the resultant into x. So uh, how do you do this? Be ba basically, to get the f, r, and the x, you have to get f, 1 in the x plus f2 in the x plus f3 in the x. We already did, um, let's say, 1 in the x. True? Wasn't that 66? F2 in the x is really easy. That's 50. And f3, that was negative uh, 21.63, which gives us 94.37 which when you put it the three significant digits is 94.4. So sorry if that was too challenging. No, it's not. Look at that. That's pretty good. Well, guess what? That's why we like Cartesian vector representation. Express every vector in our problem in Cartesian vector form because when we sum them, when we add them, you're just summing the components in the i, and then you just sum the components in the y as well as in the Z, the I, J, K, or the X, Y, Z. Yes, sir? It's supposed to be 66. Uh, 60, yeah, it doesn't write when I stroke that down. It's 66. You're correct. Thank you very much. All right. So then you would do it in the Y. Then you would be, what is the magnitude? I don't have time. I'm going to skip this, okay? But do you know how to calculate the magnitude knowing the result in X, Y? Whose theorem? The Pythag yeah, Pythagorean's theorem, right. And then you would get the angle of the orientation, once you know the magnitude, in the counterclockwise. So let me do this. I'm going to give you f of r y. This is going to be 96.77 newtons. Use this number for four significant digits. This number, four significant digits, give me theta in degrees to three significant digits. Oh, hold it. No, no, that's the resultant. Oh, man, I messed up. That's the resultant. i got to look at my notes better. 21.43. How's that? You agree? All right, now I'll give you more time. <laughs> Whoops. Hold it. I didn't hear your question, but we're out of time. So let me try and clarify. This is a wording out of the textbook, which is common. So we have our x-axis. This is the positive x direction. And our resultant force, if it's in the first quadrant, that will be theta, positive measured in the counterclockwise direction. Somebody says, uh, what happens if your resultant force is down here? Well, you could either calculate a theta, which is you know, pretty large. That would be 
uh, greater than, what, 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 look, if I go this way, it's 90. If I go that much, it's 180. If I go this much, it's 270. So it'd be, could, you could get a theta greater than 270. That's acceptable. Or you could just get a theta that's negative something. Either, either way is acceptable, all right? But in this case, our resultant is up in this uh, quadrant right up here, the first quadrant. And so theta comes in to be, um, let's just see what people got. Yeah, 12.8. 12.8. Uh, now, I'm going to give credit for 12.9, just to be nice, but uh, hmm, the other ones are a little too far off, right? So how do you make sure and get a good answer to three significant digits when you have to go back and use intermediate results, get all of their significant digits, and redo the calculation or start there from the calculation? True? All right. Now we move from 2D to 3D. And you have to trust your math a little bit more. All right, I want you to sketch a right-handed coordinate system. Sketch at least one. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to check your right-handed coordinate systems. Let's start off with a right-handed coordinate system. All right, now that we have a right-handed coordinate system down, in 3D on a piece of paper, sketch a left-handed coordinate system. All right, so when you move into uh, 3D calculations, and I'm sure some of you have done 3D calculations, you have to pay particular attention to your coordinate system. Is it either right-handed or left-handed? Right? Okay. So this is a, a question. In uh, all of uh, physics and uh, engineering, uh, which coordinate system is used most often? A, the right-handed coordinate system is used 100% of the time. B, the left-handed coordinate system is used 100% of the time. Or C, the right-handed and uh, left-handed coordinate system are about 50-50. And I've got to switch to a uh, multiple choice and then let you whoops I didn't want to do that I need to hit the start down to the wire and we're all in so let's go ahead and grade this so basically it is right-handed coordinate systems can you show me an engineering or science or mathematical textbook that even talks about a left-handed coordinate system no. Then why did you bring this up? Because it's easy for a student to draw a coordinate system that's not the traditional, needed, 100% consistent right-handed coordinate system. So you just need to know, like, if I'm going to use 3D, if I'm going to go into 3D and I'm going to have a Cartesian coordinate system, X, Y, and Z, there's a particular rep way that X and Y are related to Z. True? So, so there is, this is nonsense, but I will see somebody put together a left-handed coordinate system every now and then. It's like, ah, uh -huh. okay, let's do this one. Let's say this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. Is that a right-handed coordinate system? Right-handed coordinate system? A, yes, or B, no, only 30 seconds. X, Y, Z, just like that. Z is positive in the down direction. You're, actu you're actually a, a pretty good class compared, because normally about this time I say, come on now, get your right hand out of your pocket. Get it up there. Half of you are already doing what I asked. That's all perfect. Do something with your right hand. Now, somebody would go like this, Professor, I don't understand. Put your left hand away. We're talking about the right hand. Got the right hand? All right, you got the right hand out. What do you do to answer this problem? Put your base of your hand at the origin. Which direction do you point your fingers? In the X, positive X. Got it? So then you curl your fingers to the Y, and the thumb can only point, can only point in the positive Z. Make sense? 
base of your hand at the origin. Everybody, get your hand out. Don't be embarrassed. Right hand, come on now. We're going to conquer this and be done with it for the rest of our life. You'll be able to explain a right hand coordinate system to anybody. Where do you put it? With the origin. Positive X in the direction your fingers go. Curl them to the positive Y. Got it? And which is the positive Z? All right, maybe I shouldn't have started so hard. <laughs> Some people are not moving their hands like I want to see them. All right, let's do this one. Here is X, here is Y, and there is Z. Is that a positive right-handed coordinate system? Everybody, please, 100%. Put your hand down. Can you show me that you know what you're doing? Can you kind of, like, work it through your mind? Yes or no? Is this a good one? Then you change it up like this, and you put Z down. Is that a good right-handed coordinate system? This is still the X right here. Ain't going to work, is it? Now, this is one of these subtle points. You can work with the wrong coordinate system in 3D for an awful long time. You could do dot products. You could do vector addition. It won't make an error. But what can you not do correctly? We haven't gotten to it. It'll take us to chapter 4. Chapter 4 of this textbook. What do we do in chapter 4? Look at the title of chapter 4 if you have the textbook. Can you look at the title of chapter 4? My memory may be wrong. Maybe it's chapter 5. What's the title of chapter 4? All right. But look at section 4.1. Moment of a force. When you do moment calculations in 3D, trust your mathematics, you're going to do not do the dot product, you're going to do the cross product, the cross product. And you're going to get the cross product wrong if you don't have a right-handed coordinate system. So there you go. 99% of you, you're good to go, but some of you will just throw the coordinate system down, not think twice, then do a cross product, and you'll have garbage because it'll be a, a left-handed coordinate system, which is not a good coordinate system. Got it? So now we're going to have a force in three dimensions. And we're going to have a coordinate system in three dimensions. In our textbook, the coordinate system, the X likes to come out of the page. And then you have the Y. And then going up is the positive Z. Check it. Isn't that a good coordinate, right-handed coordinate system? Yeah. This is very common throughout the textbook. All right. Something, there's a screw, and then you have a force applied to the head of the screw. Something like that. And we want to be able to express this force in Cartesian vector form. And so you say F is equal to F in the XI, F in the YJ, F in the ZK. True? What is I? A little unit vector in the positive X. What is J? A little unit vector in the Y direction. What is K? A little unit vector in the Z direction. Hmm. Let me see if I have a question here for this guy. All right. Well, what we can do is we have to describe coordinate direction angles. We need to be good at this, which are hard to describe, but we'll have three of them. We'll have alpha, we'll have beta, and we'll have gamma. Alpha looks pretty easy to understand. Can you see and just describe this Alpha. What, how would you describe alpha? Is it from the positive x-axis to the vector and whatever plane sweeps it there, the, the, short, the, the, the shortest distance in the plane? Like I can make a plane, right, out of here. And then in 3D, alpha would be that angle. Can you see that? Now, beta, let me skip because it's a little complicated for this problem because F is going in the negative Y direction. All right. But look at gamma. It's from the positive Z to that vector where its base is starting at the origin and going out. Likewise, let's go back to beta. Positive Y to that vector in the plane. I think I'm ready for a question. As shown... Which coordinate direction angle is greater than 90 degrees? 
for this particular problem. So it's beta, true? It's beta is greater than, what's unique about it? If I take this F and I bust it into components, let me try and clean up these angles a little bit here. And I say F is going to be the sum of, let me try and change this a little bit. Uh, F of X, the magnitude F of X, plus F of Y, plus F of Z. Wouldn't the sum of those three vectors, uh, where, where I'm saying the generic vector F is F of X times I, plus F of Y times J, plus F of Z times K. But what, what it is, is one of these is negative. Can you tell that's negative? It's, it's going in the opposite direction than the positive Y axis, where both of these are positive. So if I take a look at it, alpha with respect to the X axis is going to be less than 90 degrees. Beta is going to be greater than 90 degrees. And gamma is going to be less than 90 degrees. Does that make sense? Let's say that uh, I'm just going to have a calculator test here. I say that uh, f of y is negative 5 and f, the, the total, is 10. What would be beta? Can you calculate beta for me? If f of y was you know, moving backwards 5 and this was 10, can you calculate what beta would be? All right, pretty good, 120, isn't it? So coordinate direction angle is 120 degrees, correct? Yeah, let's keep on. So now what we can do is we can now uh, describe force vectors in 3D. Did they give us the coordinate direction angles for this uh, 8 kilonewton force? No, they didn't, because the angle needs to go from the x to the, the vector f, and that would be the alpha, from the y to the vector, or from the z to the vector. What did they give us in this 30 degrees and 45, 40 degrees? What is the 30 degrees? I've had to explain this to a lot of students, so please... Let me help a little bit here. They first of all like to color code this triangle right in here. Do you see it's a slightly different color? It's tan color, right? Um, do you think this angle of that tan colored triangle is a 90 degree angle? This one right here. Yes. Yeah, it is. And so what, what, what is the key idea is this, this line right here, is that 90 degrees too also? Okay, this line right here, is it parallel with either the X or Y or Z axis? Yes. It's parallel with the X, okay? And so, so basically, they're looking at this triangle is stood up, and this edge is in the XY plane, and this other edge, maybe I should have emphasized that, is parallel with the Z, and it's coming straight up in the Z, isn't it? Straight up in the Z. So this 8 kilonewton, they're giving you the 30 degrees of how much it's coming out of the XY plane. It's a right triangle like that. All right. What about now the shaded blue? Well, you have an edge of the shaded blue, and you have an edge of the shaded blue, this edge is parallel with the Y, isn't it? And so the 40 degrees tells you the projection of that 8 kilonewton force down into the XY plane is 40 degrees back off of the positive X. See that? Right? Does that help? I know I'm seeing some grimaces, but let's sol solve this. Uh, which of the is negative? F of X, F of Y, F of Z, or none of them? Which component of F is negative?
Yeah, f of y is negative. It's in the going back. Okay? All right, how about this one? Can you calculate f of z, the magnitude in units of kilonewton? I'll go ahead and raise some of this noise so help you see it. All right, so to get the, the, the height, the f of z, how far up the vector goes, you come over here, isn't that the same length? Isn't that the same magnitude? And so you focus on the right triangle, which is the shaded tan triangle, and the angle is 30 degrees over here, and we're interested in the opposite. This is the hypotenuse. So the, the f of z is hypotenuse times the sine of the 30 degrees, or it's 8 kilonewtons times the sine of the 30 degrees. If, how many people did that? What was your answer? Four. All right. Now, f of y. f of y. Can you calculate f of y? First of all, do you expect a positive or a negative answer for f of y? There, don't forget the negative sign. Let's go. What we have to do is we have to break it, I think, into two steps calculation. What is the magnitude? We already did the opposite, right? Wasn't the opposite this side? And then this is the adjacent to the 30 degrees. And that comes in at 8 kilonewton times cosine of 30 degrees. True? Now that I'm down into the plane, I need to get only this component in the x or this component in the y and this is that shaded blue right triangle so we would take this is now the hypotenuse of the second triangle isn't it isn't it the hypotenuse of a second triangle and then this would be the opposite so we would say that this is going to be negative because I know it's going to be in the negative direction. I'm, t I'm taking ownership or responsibility for what direction it is. Now I'm focused on the magnitude. The magnitude is going to be the sine of 40 times the magnitude of the hypotenuse, which is the 8 kilonewtons times the cosine of 30. How many people had that? All right. What does that answer give us? Negative 4.45, let's take a look. Negative 4.45 is correct. All right. Uh, are any of the coordinate direction angles negative for this problem? In the interest of time, let's just do it verbally. No, no clicker on this. Are any of the co are coordinate direction angles negative? This is a tricky one. I try not to be tricky, but your coordinate direction angle uh, for this one, which is going to be for the beta, oops, this is not drawn, isn't this the, for the beta? The beta is going to be greater than 90, but beta will ne always be positive. Uh, likewise, the alpha and the gamma, the coordinate direction angles are positive. Okay? All right. So are any of the coordinate direction angles negative? None of them are negative. They're all positive. All right. Are any of the coordinate direction angles greater than 90 degrees? Yes. And one of them is not the alpha, the but the beta. But the beta is greater than 90 degrees. All right, what we would want to do in, in the interest of time is you would take this 8 kilonewtons, bust it into three components, the I, the J, and the K, and we did two of them, didn't we? We did the F of Z, and we did the F of Y, which was negative, and we just do the F of X, which is pretty straightforward, and now you have the total force is a vector like that. This is a negative right here. I'm just saying that's a negative quantity. So we do add 
and add. Okay, then you want to calculate the coordinate direction angles of that force. How would I get the alpha? How would I get the beta? How would I get the gamma? You have to think of new right triangles, or 3D, which just goes in the plane of the positive x. The force itself, come down here, isn't that alpha? And so the cosine of alpha, another right triangle, is, what is the cosine of op alpha? Adjacent over hypotenuse, which is F of X, this is the magnitude F of X divided by the magnitude of the, the hypotenuse or the resultant F, or the, the original force. So alpha is ACOS. What's the ACOS? Arc cosine. Arc cosine of F of X divided by the 8. Do you see that? And when we get to the beta, you're going to do arc cosine, and this one in the f of y is a negative number divided by f, or 8 kilonewton, and it'll give us a magnitude of angle greater than 90. All right, you have to do these on your own. Now we talk about position vectors. When we talk about a position vector, we're talking about a right-handed coordinate system, and we have what they call the origin of that coordinate system, and we march on out in the x, march out in the y, march out in the z, and oh, out here is a point, and our location of the point, the book uses this notation in parentheses, comma, comma. So we'll talk about x of a, the location, x of a, x of y, and x of z. Pretty straightforward. Then you can talk about a position vector which starts at the origin and goes to that location, a position vector. And you can express R sub A as X of A pi plus Y sub A, et cetera. And then if you have another point, this is point A, and then I have another point out here, point B, and I have the location of that one, then I can put the result or the position R sub B I have R sub A. Guess what that is? It's what I have to move the displacement vector from A to get to B. Isn't that R sub B minus R sub A? Or another way to write it, R sub B is equal to, I first go out R sub A, whoops, and then I move the displacement from A to B. That's R. And then all I do is rearrange it. I put this one, um, uh, put this one over here with the minus sign in front of it. And then I'm back to this equation. All right. Once I have position vectors, I can get magnitudes of displacements between points. That gives me the direction. I can multiply by a force times a unit vector in that direction. I can get force directed along a line. Maybe I have a rope and I'm pulling on that rope, the tension of that rope, you could have some sort of two points define the rope, and now I have the force vector defined using those two geographic locations of points. All right. Determine the locations of point A and B. Here is point A. Here is point B. Uh, let me just walk around and see you write it out on your sheet of paper. What is the location of point A? from the information given. So we're going to write it like this. A is at something, comma, something, comma, something. All of those are in units of meter. Well, in the interest of time, let me pick it up here. A lot of people got that it's five coming out here, one, two, three, four, five, from that piece of information in the X. And then it was 7, but it's not in the positive 7, so it's negative 7, and nothing. It was in the xy plane, nothing there. So now what we have to do is get location B. All right, well, the easiest part is BZ. Actually, this location, it's positive, and it'll be 10 times either the sine or cosine. Hey, we're experts at right, hand, right triangles, aren't we? Which one is it? Beat 10 times? Sine of 70. 
then we really have to bust bx and by into, I think, two steps. We get the length of this one, which is 10 times the sine of 70, and then consider that to be the hypotenuse of the other right triangle. And then for the, it'll be negative 10 sine of 70 times sine 30. True or false? Look good? And then for the y, it'll be in the positive. It'll be 10 sine 70 cosine 30. Is it 10 uh, cosine sine 30? Sine. Cosine. Oh, I messed that up. It's a cosine 70 right there. And this is a cosine 70 right there. Right. Got it? Thank you. So you got the locations of point A and point B. What's the next step? Get the displacement. What is the distance between A and B? How are you going to calculate that? So it'll be like, uh, here, is it uh, BX minus BY, not BX, B minus BY, AY, <laughs> AX, can't talk, squared, looking at the clock, trying to rush, BY minus AY squared plus BZ minus AZ squared, take the square root, what's that? Three-dimensional Pythagorean's theorem? All right, that gives us the distance. So the distance comes in right at 15.25. All right. What else do we, could you do now? Let's say that there's a force, I think that's the next part, that is 17 kilonewtons. And we know it's line of action because it goes through, the line of action goes through points A and B. You want to be able to take it and represent that as a force vector in 3D. All right. So what are the steps to do that? Get that displacement vector from A to B, which is R sub B minus R sub A. Then we want to turn that into a unit vector from A to B. What do you mean by a unit vector from A to B? I, I divide by the magnitude of that R. So R sub AB divided by the magnitude of RAB. Isn't that, won't that give me a vector of unit length in the right direction? Yeah. So what I basically did was get a little unit vector right here, UAB. Now, if I want to get that force, I multiply the magnitude of the force times that unit vector. Maybe I should put a little vector notation on these. Times the unit vector from A to B. That's a multiply, not a, as a function of multiply. All right? It's not a dot product. It's just a multiply. Okay? All right. Once you got all those and you have a nice force vector, guess what? Next question is, give me the coordinate direction angles. So you'd be doing the arc cosines of ratios. And if you want, you just go back to these unit direction vectors and you'll see that the alpha is the arc cosine of U, uh, A, B, and the X. Likewise, Beta is the arc cosine of U, A, B, and the Y. It'll work itself out real easy that way. Well, I didn't get quite as far as I needed to get today. But uh, let me cover this and I'll come back and solve a problem with it. How many people have ever had to do the dot product of two vectors? All hands go up. All hands go up. True? You've calculated dot product? What's another name for the dot product? Somebody will say it's either the scalar product or the vector product. The dot product is also called the scalar or vector product. Which is it? 
scalar because you take two inputs, which are vectors, and the resultant is a scalar. True? All right. How do I calculate the dot product? If I have the vector a and it has a sub xi plus a sub yj and a sub zk, likewise b has b sub xi plus b sub yj plus b sub zk. How many people have already know, know the answer to this? How would you mathematically compute the dot product of two vectors a and b as shown? Is it the sum of ax times bx plus ay times by plus az times bz? Yes. Make sure that you know what we're talking about on that. And then what we're going to do, read, please read all of chapter 2. And what we're going to do is use the dot product to come back and pick out parallel and perpendicular components of vectors. And then the big one, getting an arbitrary angle between two lines in 3D using the dot product. At the end of this, guess what happens? We are done with chapter two, and we move into chapter three. We will finish chapter two next time, and I thought we would finish it today, and we will move into chapter three next time. So should you read chapter three? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please do. Thank you. Can you go back a couple slides for the uh, reader's process?